So I made a programming language called Rockstar. So anyone could be a Rockstar developer. Now, about, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, the company I was working for at the time had some consultants come in to do some restructuring and help us figure out some, some problems with why we were struggling to deliver IT systems. And they did that thing consultants do where they talk to everyone and they ask a whole bunch of questions and they make recommendations. And they, they said to me, you might know, they, I think I should be promoted. They think I should be made the systems architect. Um, and so I got this email from my boss it said dear dylan this is to confirm your change of job role to systems architect effective immediately you are now responsible for architecture architecting doing architect stuff systems architecture and architecting systems congratulations on your new role kind regards your boss now i'm going to ask irina very nicely if she could mute her microphone irina could you go on mute, please? I can hear you. Hello. <laughs> there we go. So I became a systems architect. And I kind of, you know, I, I knew that there were these, these people called architects who worked in software and IT. But I didn't really understand what this, this role of architect meant. What was it that I was supposed to do? I went back to my desk and I was like, all right, I'm the architect now. Uh, this doesn't really feel any different to how it felt when I was a developer. So, you know, I started doing some digging because we have all these words in IT that we just, we kind of steal from places. Like if you listen to developers have a conversation about what they're doing at work, you will hear all these words. You know, you'll hear people talk about Python and mouse and crash and bus and launch and pipeline and all these kinds of words. And you know, these are words we've borrowed. They're words that we have taken from other domains to mean things when it comes to the, the, the realm of software. And, you know, I wanted to dive in a little bit. What was this, this word architect? Because we have these ideas. There's this controversy going on in software around whether programmers, you know, people, people like us. Now, normally this is the bit where I'd get everyone to put your hands up and say, hands up anyone who calls themselves a, a hacker, a front-end developer, back-end developer. Hands up anyone who thinks they're a coder or a designer or an engineer. Because this word engineer has become controversial. We got the word architect from engineering and software engineering. There is this debate around whether we, you know, programmers should call ourselves engineers or not. Uh, in Canada, if you want to be an engineer, you need an engineering license from the government. In New Zealand, if you want to be a software engineer, you have to have a degree that has engineer in the title, like software engineering. You cannot be a software engineer with a degree in computer science. Uh, the cable TV in my house here went out the other week, and they, they sent an engineer around to fix it. And I do not think that the person they sent had any kind of engineering qualification, you know. So... What's this, this distinction with, with architecture and engineering? Why do these, these roles even exist? Now, if you look at construction engineering, there are these famous things all over the world, monuments, buildings and towers and all kinds of stuff. And we can go out and look at great examples of building architecture. Now, here's you know, two, two classic examples. Now, the distinction that I want to talk about here, this thing, we got our little yard barbecue here on the left, and on the right-hand side of my screen, we've got the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Now, I think the thing on the left, the barbecue, the person who designed that probably built it. Like, maybe they had a little bit of help, but I don't think somebody handed over a set of plans and then got a, a crew in to come and create that. The Brooklyn Bridge was not built by the person who designed it. And that's where I think we start getting an interesting distinction, where I started to get some, some clarity around this architecture role, is it's when you get somebody in software who is designing systems that they're not going to sit down and code themselves. Somebody who has to design and communicate ideas to other developers so that they can implement components and pieces that will then fit together to make a coherent system. But, you know, in construction architecture, we have these amazing famous examples all over the world of things that we can go and see and we can go and, and look at and see what architecture is. We don't have the same thing when it comes to software. So I want to dig a little deeper and find out, you know, the origins of this. Now, the first person 
to use the term software engineering was actually this lady. This is Margaret Hamilton. She worked on the Apollo program at NASA in the 1960s. It's one of the people who built there. She ran the engineering team who built the software that took the Apollo program to the moon. And, you know, she was an advocate of, she's, like I said, first person to use the term software engineering and the first person to use the term uh, to talk about the idea of a systems view of treating software as another component in a set of you know hydraulic system guidance system navigation system software system these are all components of the apollo program that had to work together if they were going to succeed in their mission which of course they they famously did 50 50 years ago now for a long time, the term architecture, the first time we talk about architecture with respect to software, actually goes back to this guy. This, you've probably heard of this person. This is Fred Brooks. He wrote a very kind of famous and influential book called The Mythical Man Month about communication on software teams. Um, and he was the first person to talk about computer architectures. 1962, he published a, a paper talking about working on a, a system for IBM called Stretch. And he had this quote at the beginning, computer architecture, like other architectures, architecture is the art of determining the needs of the user of a structure and then designing to meet those needs as effectively as possible within economic and technological constraints. Now, for most of the history of IT, computer architecture meant hardware. And that goes right back to the title of this talk, the stuff that is expensive to change, the stuff that's hard to change. Because when you're building computer systems uh, and you know workstations, microcomputers, even mainframes at the time that Fred Brooks was working, to change any detail of the hardware meant changing your fabrication plants, changing your circuit boards, changing your uh, you know voltages and specifications and engineering manuals and factories. The cost was astronomic. One of the earliest decisions that Fred Brooks actually made with the um, the IBM Stretch system was to use eight bit by bytes instead of six, because there wasn't kind of no convention. And he's the one who went, I think we should use eight bit bytes. And that proved so, one, it worked pretty well, but also it would have been so expensive after that to ever change to a different length of byte that we are still using eight bit bytes, all of us today, uh, 56, 57 years later. But hardware was expensive to change. Software was easy. You just, you know, backspace and type something new and compile it. And even if it was a big, big change to the software, for the company who were building that system, it was a tiny, tiny part of the cost of making changes. Hardware change, difficult, expensive. Software change, relatively small, relatively easy. The, soft, the cost of the software was not really significant. Now, two things happened around the 1990s that made that you know, challenged that assumption and made us start thinking about it. Because, you know, for a long time, when I first got into doing software development and stuff, computers looked like this. You'd get a beige PC that sat in the corner of your office and you'd use it to do spreadsheets and write letters and memos and print things out. But, you know, the, the internet didn't really, the internet existed, but most businesses were not online. There wasn't really the World Wide Web. These things didn't exist. And two things happened that I think were instrumental in changing this. The first was Visual Basic. Visual Basic meant that for the first time, lots of companies were getting bespoke custom software written. Up until this point, you bought software in a shop, you installed it on your computer and it worked or it didn't work, but that was it. But Visual Basic kind of unlocked this whole idea of hiring someone to build you an application. It didn't matter if you were a travel agency or you, know, you sold flowers or you had a food delivery business. Suddenly all of these small companies were like, we should hire someone to build us a, a program to run our business more effectively. And so they started paying for software. And then, you know, they, they'd do this thing, they'd hire someone to build them a you know, catalog system or a check-in system or a menu management system. And then a couple of weeks later, inevitably, they'd be like, oh, this is not quite right. And they'd go back to the, the person who created it and the person would say, yeah, that'll be a thousand dollars. And they'd be like, what? Why do we have to pay you money to change the software? And so for the first time, lots of people and businesses started thinking about the cost of changing software systems. The other thing that happened, of course, was the web. Netscape, uh, Internet Explorer, the whole World Wide Web, the digital revolution that took place around the, the mid-1990s. And the thing about that is that for the first time, companies could use software to provide services 
directly. Like it wasn't anymore that we were using spreadsheets and word processors to deliver groceries or to deliver tires or, uh, you know, fly airplanes or anything. You could literally sell software. The software did the work and people would pay for what you did. We could sell digital content, digital music, digital films, digital documents, uh, online tools and services like we have now, things like Trello and Gmail, all these kinds of applications, which meant for the first time there were companies that existed that had no assets. Software was the only thing they had. And all of their running costs, all of their overheads and salaries were paying people to update the software and change the software. And so the cost of changing the software suddenly became the biggest factor in whether those businesses were making profit or not. The stuff that's hard to change. We started discovering that some kinds of changes in software were easy and relatively low risk and other kinds of changes in software were difficult and high risk and had a massive risk of breaking things. And people started saying, well, what if the easy stuff is just code and the rest of it is this thing we are going to call architecture? What is the architecture of the software system? Because that would dictate how easy it was to make big changes to it. Now, the phrase software architecture kind of goes back to this book from the 1990s, Software Architecture, Perspectives on an Emerging Discipline, Mary Shore and, and David Garland. And this was an attempt to, uh, somebody described it at the time, it was an attempt to catalog a folklore. All these people were building systems, they had their own ideas, their own stories that they'd kind of share on Usenet or tell each other over coffee and stuff. No one had ever started cataloging writing this stuff down. So let's dig into what we think architecture really is. Now I'm going to go back to that original quote from Fred Brooks. Computer architecture, the art of determining the needs of the user of a structure, designing to meet those needs as effectively as possible within economic and technological constraints. So I'm going to hone in on these three parts of that statement. So first of all, determining the needs of a user. Now, when you work in software, it's easy to think, well, the user is the person on the other end who's sending the emails and clicking the buttons and you know, logging into everything. When you're doing architecture, who are your users? Well, the answer is your users are developers. The decisions you make and the things that you create are going to be used by the developers who build the system that goes to what we will call the end users, the, the people at the other end who are feeding the money back into your system. But it goes beyond that because you're not just designing, you know, creating an architecture and design for the people who already work on your team. You are trying to anticipate the needs of the developers you haven't hired yet who are gonna be using technology that doesn't exist yet to build products that you haven't thought of yet to sell to customers you haven't met yet. And as an architecture, your job is to keep all of these people happy, right? So it sounds like if we're trying to build stuff which is gonna work over a, a period of you know, five, 10, 20 years, we are gonna to need to make a plan. And the problem with planning is that in software, planning has got a bit of a negative reputation. Now, you know, you're all familiar with this, this idea of the agile manifesto, okay? And uh, you should respond to change instead of following a plan. Now, I don't know if any of you know, but uh, this is, is René Descartes, a uh, famous French philosopher, but he was also an agile consultant. Um, and, you know, the, there's a famous joke about Descartes. He's in a restaurant one night and uh, the waiter says, would you like anything else? He says, yes, I'd like a cup of coffee without milk. And the waiter goes to the kitchen, he comes back and he says, I'm very sorry, Monsieur Descartes, uh, we don't have any milk. Would you like coffee without cream? Now, not a lot of people know this, but Descartes, like I said, he also worked as an agile consultant. And he's in with his, his team one day and he says to them, you know, the, the agile manifesto says that we should respond to change instead of following a plan. And the customer says, oh, this is brilliant. We don't have a plan. And Descartes is like, oh, sacre bleu. If you don't have a plan, how can you choose not to follow it? We have to make a plan. Agile does not say don't make a plan. It says there is value in the items on the right, but we value the items on the left more. What the, the uh, authors of the Agile Manifesto had seen was teams who had, they had made a plan and then they learned new information. Something happened, they missed a deadline, they discovered a new technique, but they stuck to the plan anyway, even when it didn't make sense anymore. That's what they were trying to, you know, sort of eliminate. Now, there is another thing, one of the principles behind that Agile Manifesto says, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Now, 
self-organizing teams are brilliant. It's one of the greatest things about working with really smart people in software is everybody just feeds their good ideas back into the group and you find the things that work, you stick with those, and you end up with a system where everyone is happy, everyone's working on the right thing, you're being very, very productive. You can't guarantee that's going to happen. One of the things as an architect you need, you've got to give them something to work with that they can evolve beyond that and allow the self-organization to start to happen. If you just turn up on day one and say to your team, hey, self-organize, you'll come back after two weeks and be like, how's it going with the project? They're like, what project? You're like, the project we're working on. They're like, oh, you didn't say anything about a project. You just told us to self-organize. We self-organized across the street and we've been having drinks. You want to come along? You need something. You know, self-organization is something that emerges from high-functioning teams. It's not a guarantee. If you see it happening, you get out of the way and let it happen. But don't bank on it happening immediately on day one. It takes the right combination of people, the right combination of problems, and a little bit of time for that to settle in. So we're talking about working within constraints. So here's a set of, of constraints for building a software system. Here are the rules of our software department. No new hires, not allowed. No JavaScript, no open source, no Microsoft, no cookies. By order of the management. Uh, this is actually how Oracle company uh, builds software. Um, we're not going to work there. We're going to work somewhere else. And being aware of these constraints, what you can do, what you can't do, is fundamental to informing the decisions you're going to have to make as a software architect. Now, sometimes one of the things you can bring to the table as an architect is knowing when a constraint isn't valid anymore. For a long time, everybody in the world said that touchscreen phones were never going to work because we had all used the kiosks at the airport and on the cash machines, and they're always clunky, and you have to kind of press them a little bit too hard and all this kind of stuff. And it was a team working at Apple who uh, around about you know, 2005, 2006 were like, the time is right. Now is the time. Now we can go and we can do touchscreen phones. The technology exists now to be able to do that. And, you know, the iPhone went on to become one of the most successful products, you know, in, in history ever created. One of the other things that you're going to have to do as an architect is you're going to have to tell your team why they can't use the thing they want to do. They're going to come to a conference like FW Days or something, and they're going to get back to... <laughs> back to the office or back online on, on Monday as we're all working now. And they're going to be like, hey, we want to use the new shiny JavaScript framework that we saw. And you're the one who's going to have to say to them, uh -uh, you can't use the new shiny JavaScript. All we have here is Internet Explorer. And you're going to need to enforce those kinds of constraints. So there we go. Determining user needs, meeting those needs within economic and technological constraints. That's the purpose of architecture. Now, you know, how do we actually do it? What does the architect's day-to-day -day job look like? Now, to me, this comes down to three steps. First of all, make decisions. Secondly, you have to communicate those decisions so the rest of your team know what you're thinking and what you're proposing that you do. And then you have to reinforce those decisions, help make sure that they happen, help follow through on this and then get them right. So how do you make decisions? Well, this is about understanding the, the playing field, if you like, understanding all the different elements which you need to be aware of when you design the system that you're working on. First of all, what have you got? Understand your existing technology. Now, you can spend a lot of time reading code and reading specifications and interviewing people. The view that I found gives you the best information in the shortest space of time for doing this is look at the borders, look at the boundaries, be like, you know, the passport control offices. You want to understand the flow of traffic between the components in a system. It's a very, very simple architecture. It's a website that's connected to the internet. Now, as an architect, the thing I'm interested in here is that piece in the middle, HTTP. The internet, I don't care. That's out there. It's massive. You're never going to understand the whole thing. Website here, PHP, .NET, JavaScript, Node.js, you know, as the architect, I don't really care what that's written in, but this HTTP thing in the middle, I want to understand that. How many transactions per second can it handle? When it stops handling them, what happens? Do I get timeouts? Do I get 500 errors? Do I get rate limited? Uh, is it secure? Is there a certificate? When does the certificate expire? What verbs are valid on that? What HTTP methods are allowed to travel across that? Does it do get, put, post, uh, delete? options, head, is there any extended web dev kind of stuff going on there? Uh, you know, you can learn an awful lot about a website just by looking at the HTTP traffic that is flowing backwards and forwards. How are those requests structured? What sort of traffic is flowing in and out of that? Now, 
when you're looking at systems like this, as an architect, you don't necessarily care about what something was designed to do or what it was supposed to do. You want to can channel this guy, Gene Kranz, Apollo 13 mission director. I don't care what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. Because I found both extremes. I found uh, you know, systems I've worked on and companies I've worked with where they have a, a high capacity login system that actually isn't high capacity at all. It says high capacity on the specs because that was what was in the meetings where they built it, but actually it can cope with about 10 people logging in at the same time. And after that, you start getting server errors and database deadlocks and timeouts. But you know, I've also worked on systems where they found like an entire Redis cluster that kind of wasn't really factored in anywhere. And it's like, well, this is brilliant. You've got a whole Redis stack here up and running already. We can use that. That's a really powerful piece of, piece of technology that we can incorporate into our solution. Look at what things can do, not what they were designed to do, what they can do. That's what you need to understand. Now, some people will be like, well, I don't have any systems to worry about. I'm doing a greenfield project here. Uh -uh. There is no such thing as a greenfield project. Every system you ever work on, there will already be some things out there that you need to know about. Some of them will be things you can use. Some of them will be things you are not allowed to use. Almost every good idea, somebody will have tried to solve it before. If what you are working on looks like a greenfield system, that means that they have buried the politics around the first version of the system, you need to be aware of, of what happened there because that's the unexploded bomb. That's the point where you go into a meeting and you're like, yeah, um, actually I'm thinking we could use a distributed database for this. And you don't know that the last time they tried to do this, distributed database became a really, really bad word to use in any meetings or anything. Look out for where those are. There will be the rabbit holes. So where something that's supposed to take 20 minutes ends up taking a week. You're doing OAuth provider integration. Uh, you got well, Google's working, Facebook's working. This is brilliant. Sign in with Microsoft is working. Hey, let's do sign in with Apple. And suddenly it's like, why did this take six days when the rest took about an hour each? Um, actually, I, I can't single out Apple. That's just a hypothetical example. But you know the kind of thing, something you think is going to be easy. You think, yeah, we'll do that this afternoon or a week later. You're like, it's still not working. Watch out for the rabbit holes. And yes, somewhere, there is likely to be the wreckage of version one, the previous incarnation, the last attempt to solve this problem, whether that's yours or another company's or a potential competitor's, the more you can find out about that, the better, because there's information and potentially technology in there that you can reuse. What do you need? It's about asking the right questions. Now I could do whole talks and workshops just about asking the right questions, but it's about informing a certain kind of conversation with your business stakeholders. Everyone says we want our website to be fast. How fast? You know, sit them down, mock up some systems and show them, well, this is responding within 500 milliseconds for 90% of requests. And you get one of your product owners or your business stakeholders to click, 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 click. And they're like, what was that? And you're like, well, that one in 10 requests or one in 100 requests is gonna go slowly. How slowly? This slowly. Can we make it faster? And that gets you into a conversation about this is how much it's gonna cost. This is what we're gonna to need to build. It'll take this much longer. It'll cost this much in terms of infrastructure, or we can chop some things out. Why don't we get rid of some of the JavaScript or some of the, the tracking cookies or some of those things that will improve the page load time. What's valuable here? Inform those kinds of conversations. People say they want their systems to be secure. Well, secure against who? You know, who are your, your, your threat actors in this scenario? Are you worried about botnets trying to break in and steal credit card numbers? Are you worried about, you know, somebody has had a fight with the partner and the partner is angry and wants to go on and deface their Facebook profile? Uh, you know, what are you afraid of? If you're nation states dealing in nuclear secrets and those kinds of things, very, very different threat model to if you're something like Instagram. Yeah, you need to be able to have those kinds of conversations. What can you build? Understanding capabilities. So to me, this comes down to, to four things that all begin with P. So I get to use this slide. People, patterns, packages, and process. People, who are you working with? What is the technology that they're good with? Where, what makes them most productive? Uh, you know, what's the tech stack? What's the revision control systems? What's the deployment pipelines? What do those people want to work on? Do you have a bunch of Java engineers who are all secretly learning Scala in their spare time because they want to go and do another job? Do you have a, a bunch of people doing .NET WinForms who actually are really itching to do .NET Core and get onto Azure DevOps and all this kind of stuff? Understand not just what you're paying people to do, but what are they interested in doing and what are they productive at doing and where their strengths are? 
patterns is very much about choosing a technology platform that is good at solving the kind of problems that you're going to have. The best example I've ever seen of this is Ruby on Rails does MVC, Model View Controller. If you choose Ruby on Rails as your development platform, you use MVC because if you don't, you are going to be fighting against your framework the whole way. Every decision you make, you're going to have to implement in half a dozen places because that framework is trying to lead you down a certain pattern. If you're working with modern.net, we have ASP.net MVC, we have ASP.net Web API. We have all these different conventions now around routing and middleware and authentication. And you know these are implementations of design patterns. You want to understand the pattern and you want to understand how easy it is to build one of those using the technology and the, the people that you're working with. Packages is about the richness of the ecosystem. If you are doing a project that involves lots of uh, image imports and exports and lots of different formats, you probably don't want to be building image encoders for TIFF and JPEG and BMP and PIC and PCX and SVG and all these different formats. You want to be working in an ecosystem where those kinds of things are easily supported. You can install a package or a library or a DLL or a gem and get access to those things natively. And process is about if you decide on Monday what you're going to do that week, how confident can you be in going round and round that iterative development cycle? How smooth is the thing? How much turbulence is there in your team's velocity about what you can deliver and how long it's going to take to deliver it? What can you buy? Platform as a service, software as a service. Uh, that's something that I've said in more than one meeting. If you can't sell it, buy it. Never use PowerShell when you could use MasterCard. With developers, you know, we love building stuff. Somebody says, oh, we've got that problem again where the, you know, one of the, the Amazon boxes is being left on overnight and it's our staging environment. So really we don't need it when the team aren't working. Um, and somebody goes, oh, I can build a scheduler for that. And they start typing and doing some shell scripting. Uh, now, you're not going to sell that unless you're in the business of selling, you know, virtual machine management, budget management systems. That's going to solve your problem, but it's going to create another problem in that you now have another piece of software you need to maintain, you need to manage. All the stuff that you're paying to support is the stuff you want to be selling to your own customers or things that directly support that. If you can't sell it, buy it. Find someone who solved that problem and use their system instead. And finally, what can you lose? You know, do not duplicate. Look for the same problem being solved more than once. Uh, I once did a, an audit of systems that sent email at a place I was working. I think I found about nine different systems that sent email. And this was because we needed to do some rebranding. And so I was going through, we wanted to change the look and feel and the color scheme in these emails. And because there were nine different email relay systems working, that became an architectural problem because we had to make the same changes in nine different places across about five different code bases, probably three or four different languages and platforms. Just because, you know, the, the first one I built, second one someone else built because they didn't know that I'd built one already. The third one, somebody looked at the first two and went, okay, we just spin up mail.send every time we need to send some, some mail here. We build layers on top of that. By the time you know you realize that you've got nine of these things, it's then a massive job to get them all consolidated back to one thing. Decide what to do. Now, this is kind of, I've said this is the easy part. Um, you'll have good ideas. By the time you've been through that whole process and that exercise, you'll have some ideas in your head about what is going to work and what's not going to work, and you'll have some good ideas about how to try them out. Um, if you get to the end of that process and you don't have any good ideas, perhaps software architecture is not for you. But I've never known that happen yet. You know, this stuff is, is interesting and it's inspiring. And when you work with it, you start getting, oh, we could use that and we could use that and we could use that. And this kind of stuff comes in and you start sketching out ideas, you validate them. And then you get on to the hardest part, which is communicating decisions. Now, the problem with software is it doesn't exist. It's not like buildings. It's not like cars. It's not like airplanes or food or any of these things. It is information. And information is invisible until we work out how to depict it, illustrate it, draw it. And so you have this idea in your head. You have a design for the system, and it looks like this and it's beautiful, and it's perfect. It's this wonderful crystal palace of glittering thought stuff. And you try and communicate that to your team, and you end up with this. And your team look at the diagram, and they're like, uh, is, that, uh, is that microservices in the middle there? With the, what, what, what's this piece here? Is, is, that, is that middleware? I don't know. 
diagrams are a problem. Now, we go back to our ideas about construction engineering. When you design a building, you make a drawing, looks like this, and you make another drawing, it looks like this, and you get a slightly different drawing, looks like this, and you get some really quite high fidelity drawings, look like this, and then by the time the building is finally being built, you can picture in your head what it's gonna look like. We are very, very good at this because one of the earliest things that we learn to do as, as humans is how do we figure out drawings? We draw the world around us. We draw pictures of people. We draw pictures of faces. We learn to look at drawings in picture books and things and figure out how the world works from that. It's a skill all of us uh, you know, trained into at a very, very early age. Software is a little bit more difficult. Now, I'm going to show you a software diagram. Here is a piece of software architecture. Uh, who wants to go and build me one of these? Anybody? I'd ask you to raise your hands, but obviously you're allowed on YouTube. So I, I'm going to assume that nobody has got their hands up right now because it, you can't tell at all what this is. Now, this is actually a formal notation. This is an official uh, specification language for building software architecture diagrams. So first thing I'm going to do is give you all a clue. I'm going to say, all right, well, maybe you, you, know, you, you missed that lecture when you were in engineering school. So boom, this is the Jordan DeMarco notation. And here's what it is. So now you're like, all right, Excelsior is a database or a file system. Okay. And this JK6G, that's a database or a file system. All right. And then there's functions and data flows and Okay, so we got some data kind of flowing, but you still don't really have any idea. Let's add some more detail to this. Let's start annotating it a bit. Okay, so now we got Excelsior is a database of customer details. Okay, that's fine. Um, Mercutio is a .NET service. All right, we know how to build one of those. Uh, that's a Windows file share. Okay, I, th I thought that kind of looked familiar. Um, Norman is a .NET app here that sends email, and, and Mandrill is the MailChimp SMTP relay service. So, by the way, these names are all real names. Naming things is hard. Um, Excelsior was called that because the data came from Excel. Uh, the thing on the top, the top right, the JK6, that was a company where all the servers were named after their Dell asset tags. M$ is a Windows default file share. Naming things is hard. So if you're going to use code names on diagrams, what I tend to do is put them in quotes, because then people know that this isn't something you can go and, and look up on the internet and stuff. Now, our decision here to use Jordan DeMarco means we can only imagine four kinds of things. We can imagine databases or file systems, you know, because what's the difference between a database and a file system, really? Functions, data flows, input, output. That's not going to help, you know. What if we threw away that notation and we came up with our own way of depicting the stuff that we are talking about. Let's go online, we'll find some clip art and get some Windows icons and stuff. We'll start dropping those on. Now, don't be afraid to use color and, and that kind of stuff. I'm going to color code some of these lines because these data flows are not actually the same. Now, there we go. I'm going to add a key to that. Now you're looking at this and thinking, okay, this is looking like something I can have a reasonable conversation about. How are we going to build this? We got a SQL database there. We've got this .NET server. What's this red thing? Okay, that's RabbitMQ. There's a message queuing system here. This is SMTP. I'm going to go one level deeper, and I'm going to start annotating these data flows that are on this thing. Okay. Now, now we're looking at a system that I'm sure some of you are looking at this and going, all right, I could have a stab at starting to put together some of this, or at least talk into the rest of my team about how we're going to build this and what we're going to need to figure out in order to build and deliver this system. We know we've got this database. We know we've got a, a email template thing that puts things on a queue. We know we've got a .NET app that sends email. Now, what happens inside those boxes, that's up to the team. You know, I don't care how the .NET app sends emails. You can see from this that it's got to get stuff off a queue and it's got to push it out through Mandrill, which is MailChimp's SMTP relay. How you do that, that's not architecture. That's just programming development. You know, that's your thing. So let's compare these two diagrams. Same system. One of them looks nice and neat and clean and elegant like the ones in the books. The other one is looking a little bit, I mean, this one looks kind of nice because it's simple. But real life architecture gets complicated and messy, particularly if you're trying to document systems that already exist. Um, one of the problems with learning things is when they, they write textbooks and people do webinars and stuff, they always use these little clean, minimalist kind of hello world examples that don't really show you how 
busy these things can get. Uh, this is a real software architecture diagram, which I'm, I'm guessing on the YouTube stream is going to look like nothing at all. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, and you know, you can start seeing some of the kinds of complexity. There's probably over 100 different systems and components on here, all annotated with data flows of what goes where and how the whole thing works, and a little ad hoc note saying, this is a big red button that will reset the whole system if you click it. Um, and this is real. This is a real diagram that I put together of some existing architecture as part of a, an engagement I was doing with some, some outsourcing people who are adding a new component to this. I want to say one more thing on the subject of diagrams. Here are two software architecture diagrams. One of these is something called the hexagonal architecture. Which one do you think is the hexagonal architecture? Yeah, it's not the one with the hexagons in it. Um, there are these names that pop up, hexagonal architecture. Hexagonal architecture is another name for a pattern called ports and adapters. And it just so happened that the, the book where this pattern was first introduced, all the diagrams in that book used hexagons, and so it became the hexagonal architecture. People talk about it. The thing here that looks like a beehive, like a honeycomb with the hexagons, I made that up. That's nothing. But you know, don't be afraid to kind of raise your hand in a meeting or just stop and go, hang on a second. Um, can I just check that we all understand the same thing when we talk about the hexagonal architecture? Can I understand? that we, we all understand the same thing when we talk about what is a port, what is an adapter. Because it's easy, one, it's easy to, to you know, misunderstand these terms because they get bounced around a lot on blog posts and Twitter and conversations and conferences. Um, it often takes time for us as an industry to agree what we mean when we say these things. Um, and it can be difficult if you're a junior person on the team to be the one who puts your hand up and says, I don't understand that word. But as the architect, you can be like, can we just clarify what we mean here? And one, it helps you, two, it helps everybody else. Someone says hexagonal architecture, you can be like, right, let's just sketch out what we think that looks like. So reinforcing decisions. We've designed our system. We've done all our analysis. We've figured it out. We have an idea. This is us coming up with that big long-term plan. And reinforcing decisions is down to two things, validation and verification. Validation is, are we building the right thing? Are we solving the right problem? Verification is, are we building it properly? Having chosen our solution, validation, did we pick the right solution? Yes or no. Verification, are we implementing that solution the way we plan to? Are we following the plan? And if we go back again to our construction example, there's the plan, there's the product. You can hold them up side by side and be like, yep, this looks pretty good. In software, here is the plan. How do we look at the product? How do we look at the finished system that we built? Well, I don't know. There's a bunch of different ways we can look at it. Let's go on to Windows Azure, Microsoft Azure, and have a look at the dashboard. Now, this is very pretty, and it's got lots of interesting information and valuable information on it, but it doesn't actually tell us anything. Certainly not about the design of the way the system's been put together. Maybe we could have a look at the build server and have a look in, in Team City. And I'm still not really seeing whether it looks like that plan that we had. Uh, let's try one more. Let, let's have a look at the code. And mm, nope. So we've got four different views on a system there. How do we decide which ones are valuable, which ones are relevant, and how do we identify the kind of the correctness between these different views on the system? Now. One of the things, mistakes that I made very early on when I started doing this, this architect role is I thought, I know, I have a good idea. I will do all the code reviews so everyone else can write the code and I will review the code. Now, there are two problems with that. One, you'll burn out really quickly. Any good team will be writing code faster than you can keep up with reviewing it. They will be churning out lines and functions and classes and you're going to get there and it's going to be eight o'clock at night and you're like, oh, I got to review all this stuff before I can go home, all right? And so when you get tired, you get burned out. The code reviews get pretty superficial because you're struggling to keep up with the amount of stuff. But also, it constrains your teams to only being able to write code that the architect knows how to review and you end up with this scenario where the architect is like, I reviewed your C-sharp code and I still don't know what it does. And your team lead says, dude, my team switched to Haskell two years ago. Don't constrain the teams by doing code review. The other problem with doing code review is at a sort of superficial level, just glancing over code and looking at it, it's very difficult to tell whether it's doing the right thing. It's just easy to tell whether it looks right. Here's a bunch of code. We've had a meeting 
and said, all right, we're going to do database access using the repository pattern. We're going to mediate identities through an identity map. And everyone has gone, oh, repository, oh, identity map. Yeah, very nice. All right, and they write that down. And then this, this code ships, and you're looking at it. Now, all you can really tell from looking at this is that there's something called a customer repo, and there's something called an identity map, and that get customer calls map.find. You can't actually see whether that identity map is being implemented according to the, the brief for that pattern. You can't tell whether customer repo is being used in the same way in the application. Uh, relying on names to navigate the structure of a code base can be risky. Some teams do this very well, but it's open to, to misunderstanding. It's like you're walking around a city late at night, and it's dark, and you see a sign that says luxury hotel and that's all you can see is the sign you think all right i'll stay here this this would be nice and then boom turns out it's the premier hotel rus or something similar so what do you do how do you kind of you know encourage these these patterns and gently guide your teams down the correct path when it comes to implementation details so one of the most powerful patterns that you can employ is you've heard of Conway's law, right? This idea that you want to, uh, people who talk to each other a lot will build components that talk to each other a lot. And people who don't talk to each other very much will build components that don't talk to each other very much. Um, you can use that. You can align people and technology and the design of your system. You'd be like, right, you front end, you all want to do Angular. We'll put you here where you can talk to each other or you're on the same Slack teams or Zoom or Hangouts or whatever. Uh, you collaborate on front end. You will build tightly coupled systems. You over here, you're doing back end. You all want to do F sharp. Brilliant. You're the F sharp team. You're the back end team. They talk to each other every day. Maybe once a week, you have like an interface design meeting between those two systems. You can push this further. If you've got geographically distributed teams, how about this? You have all your F sharp developers, you know, over here in, in Ukraine, they're doing all the calculation systems. You got your front end web team uh, up here in London, they're doing all the Angular stuff. You got an Android team down in, in Portugal somewhere, and they're doing the mobile application development. And, you know, by introducing where you want systems to have to communicate through interfaces, which is expensive, look for the communication patterns in your organization that are expensive, the long distance things, the maybe even language barriers and stuff, and see, can we somehow uh, use that to enhance the output of the system and the design of the system we're going to end up creating? To help teams get started, as the architect, take this example, you've got these two teams. Now, they're not ready to integrate with each other yet. But what you can do is you can work with them. You've got your front end team. You're like, right, I'm going to help you sketch out the fake JSON. You can't talk to a real server yet. But what we can do is we can stub out some JSON documents that look like the ones you'll be getting off the live API. And then you can start building your front end against that fake JSON. Back end team, you can be like, right, we're going to write some specification tests here that simulate what the front end is going to be doing and start sketching that out. That allows both teams to go and start implementing things. You're involved in the fake JSON and the spec tests, but you're not actually building the systems. Then you can switch the fakes off. You can plug those systems into each other and connect them together. And as the architect, you want to look here the traffic that is flowing between those two systems, because that's what's going to show you whether your expectations and your assumptions around the design of the system are being validated correctly. One of the questions that comes up a lot, should architects code? Yes, architects should absolutely code. Otherwise, you get rusty and you get out of touch and you start hating your job, because lots of us went into this because we love coding. But don't code production facing, customer facing systems. Because what'll happen is you'll have a good idea and you'll be like, oh, I could just quickly implement this myself or I can have a design meeting and brief the rest of the team and update the wiki and update the specs. And the temptation to just implement it yourself will become overwhelming if you can resist that temptation. You have stronger discipline than I do. The best place that I found as the architect to kind of you know, stay involved in doing stuff Build the dashboards and the monitoring systems. You know, that's where you can add value to this. Tap into that network traffic and those patterns and, you know, up times and performance and CPU load and all these kinds of things that you expected to go a certain way and build the dashboards that you show to your stakeholders. Build the thing that gets put up on the big screen in the middle of the office that everyone can look at. One... <coughs> you'll get a chance to collaborate with the developers on all those different teams. Two, you don't become the bottleneck on anything that's customer facing. Three, you still get to write code and you get to build real things that real people do. And four, that gives you another view onto what's going on with the system.
And one more thing that, you know, I think people often forget. When you're doing architecture well, you're going to be part of decisions that are good for the business and not good for the developers. You're going to decide to outsource something or you're going to decide to use some kind of software as a service platform that is brilliant in terms of you know business benefits and stuff, but the developer experience maybe isn't so great. Lots of horrible stuff with XML and certificates and bad documentation and stuff. And we tend, you know, humans and developers tend to forget when bad stuff goes away, we forget quite quickly that it was ever there. And we just look at the bad stuff that's in front of us now. And, you know, I had, this is a real example. We did a CRM integration, which was a little bit painful to do. But one of the things that happened is we used to run mailing lists every single week. There would be, someone would have to run all these queries and export the results of spreadsheets. And that was a real pain in the ass. And after the CRM integration, that went away. <laughs> And the team are like, oh, CRM kind of sucks. And you know, after a couple of weeks, you can be like, do you remember those mailing lists we used to do? And everyone's like, oh, yeah. And you can be like, have you noticed how we don't have to do the mailing lists anymore? And the team will be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Now you, now you put it that way. I understand you know, why we did that. Um, and finally, you know, I want to end by saying, everyone remember software architecture is a young discipline you know it the computers only go back 50 or 60 years at this point software architecture we didn't even have a textbook until 1995 we've had 25 years to try and get this stuff right our colleagues over in construction engineering came up with this 3000 BC, 5000 years ago. And they've had all that time to figure out what works and what doesn't work and how to draw things and how to communicate things. And, you know, they've invented all these amazing innovations. But you can also look at it and be like, you know what, we got from, uh, you know, six bit bytes to distributed microservices and cloud high volume, high throughput transactions. And, you know, think for a second about the technology, which is making it possible for you to watch me talking right now. It's astonishing. We've done that in five decades. Construction engineering went from this to this, like, hey, same shape, but we'll make it out of glass this time. And that took them 5,000 years. So check back in in 5,000 years and let's see where the state of the art is in terms of software, architecture, and engineering. Jakuyu, spasiba, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. That was a lot of fun. I will see you. I think we're doing a Q&A session now, and there's going to be some Zoom drinks later at the end of the day, so I'm going to stick around for those. Thank you for watching. Dylan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Thank you for your amazing talk. <laughs> People admire your presentation. They, they say that... Uh, they have never seen such a good presentation, not talking about marketing one. So thank you very much. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you. That's nice. Uh, sorry that we had this voice interruption in the beginning. We were figuring That's out fine. how to mute it. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, uh, the online format is, is very, very weird. Yeah, uh, that, that's what, you know, I've, I've been figuring you can see I, I so I'm coming to you now with this this stream and I'm standing in front of a green screen. So if I do that, you see my hands actually disappear <laughs> off the edge and I can sort of whoa, and if I go over here, I just vanish out of shot. <laughs> so we got all this cool technology. But of course, everyone's having to figure it out at home by themselves. And it's not like we can we can all go and have a big meeting and plan how we're going to do this because the whole, you know, the lockdown situation came in so quickly. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've had some fun. I've had cats jumping in on video conference calls and parties happening over Zoom and all. We're starting to get the hang of it, but. <laughs> yeah, how are you doing in the lockdown? I've heard that your work amount have doubled. You well, you not only yeah. have work, uh, but, but, but you run conferences, you prepare talks, you run workshops. How is it possible? Um, it's somebody said to me the other that you know the english expression in the land of the blind the man with one eye is king um you know this whole thing kind of happened really unexpectedly but i got like a little bit of a head start on it because when the sort of you know it, it came because a, a month ago the 4th of march uh i was on an actual conference a physical conference you remember those when people used to get together um which was on a, a cruise ship between copenhagen and oslo 
Um, and we, we did go to Oslo and that, that was great. We had about 200 people on this boat and kind of a couple of people were like, maybe this isn't a good idea. And a couple of us were like, well, let's go along and see what happens. And literally like within a week, it was like, no, that's it. Everything locking it down, shutting everything down. Um, and I was, I was very lucky because the first virtual meetup that I went to was actually run by somebody who's an expert on doing this kind of stuff. It's a lady called Judy Reese. Um, and she was like, I'm going to do this, this uh, presentation on Zoom and showed us how Zoom worked and showed us breakout rooms and also shared a lot of really good insight about how to run virtual online events and how to do difficult conversations remotely and everything. Um, and kind of, you know, I, I took a look at that. I was like, there was actually a lot of stuff to figure out here. And I just sort of dived into it. And I got a whole bunch of, you know, friends and other speakers and people I've worked with, got them all on a Slack together and said, let's, let's figure this out. You know, you want to test out your camera? Cool. We'll get 10 people on a call and do that. Um, and kind of within a week, conferences were coming to me and going, we know you're doing stuff with virtual online events. Can you help? So I'm, I'm working with NDC now, you know, NDC, uh, we're doing just at NDC Copenhagen as a virtual online event. Uh, next week, we're doing NDC Porto. A couple of weeks' time, we're doing NDC Oslo, which is like five, nine tracks, five days, about 1,800 people, I think, last year. Um, and of course, we're having to run the whole thing online. And so it's not just figuring out what works. It's having a time, you know, any of our speakers who are like, oh, I need to test out my webcam or something. I'm like, all right, we'll jump on a call. Uh, and they want to figure out how to use Zoom or how to use WebEx or how to do, will this video presentation work over a live stream? I don't know. Let's try it. And so I've been blogging and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird to be this busy and never go outside. <laughs> Dylan, I really appreciate you being so active and uh, uh, offering so much of yourself to the developers community. Thank you very much. We've got some questions well, to you. All right. Let's let's uh, see what we what we have. Uh, first of all, which tool did you use for the diagram when you were talking about Mercutian, ex Excel uh, yeah. Norman Mandrill? <laughs> did you use anything or just uh, draw it manually? Uh, that was, uh, so I have a couple of different things. That one I did in, in Visio, Microsoft Visio, um, which is a, pla a package I've used for a long, long time that I find very, very good for drawing, you know, just diagrams, laying out lines and boxes and, and this kind of stuff. Uh, there's always a risk with diagrams that you can kind of get too obsessed with making it look nice. Um, and it's very important to be like, does this need to look amazing? Is this going to go in a book or a blog post? Or is this just something to pass around with my team? Um, and Visio, I find, gets me something that looks good enough. And it, it gets there quite quickly. The, the really big complex one was also done in, in Visio. Um, and, you know, Visio is a, is a pretty good package once you figure out the quirks of how to use it. But there's also, there's a, a great website called Web Sequence Diagrams where you type in, like ASCII, you just type in text and it generates little diagrams for you based on that. Um, if you're doing kind of user interface design stuff, which is a little bit out of sort of core architecture, there's things like Balsamic, there's Adobe XD. Um, there is no one right answer. With a lot of these things, you know, I have, I have Adobe Illustrator, I have Visio, I have Balsamic, I have Axia um, RP. And at some point with any one of these tools, I might be like, yeah, this isn't really working and I'll export it and load it into something else and try that. But Visio is where I tend to start. Thank you. There is a question coming from Ivan. Yeah. Did you hey, mean Ivan. Hey, Ivan. Did you mean that code review is not right thing for just architect or in general? Um, specifically, what I meant there is that doing code reviews, code reviews are good. Code reviews are great. Everyone should do code reviews. Uh, one, because you want two sets of eyes on the code in case there are mistakes in it and bugs and misunderstandings because we're human and, and we, we mess up. Um, two, because it's a good way of making sure two different people understand what is happening and what's changing. And three, it's a good way of learning. People reading each other's code is a good way of learning new patterns. I think I learned about when I first learned about generics in .NET. Um, I was looking at someone else's code. I was like, what's this thing with the angle brackets? And they're like, do you not know about generics? And I'm like, what's generics? And, um, but what I specifically meant there is that as the architect, code review is not a good way of encouraging the correct architecture because there will be too much code for you to keep up with. Code reviews are good, but they are not the right way, certainly in my experience, trying to use code review as your, um, you know, your, your main method for reviewing the architecture of a system, you're just going to burn out. 
code is a very expensive way of figuring out, having to read you know, lines and lines of code is a very time consuming way to figure out what a system is doing. And they can write code faster than you can review it, which is one of the weird things about software, but there it is. Um, and so specifically, I meant, you know, if you are the architect, do not expect to review all the code your team are creating. You've got to trust them to get the code right. And then you need to figure out a different way of looking at what's happening to step in and help out if it looks like they're, they're not doing quite the right thing. Okay. We've got another question from Marinka. How to yeah. efficiently organize the code review process to make sure that things have been correctly implemented? Uh, the best way I found of doing code reviews is uh, GitHub. <coughs> You implement, uh, so there's some controversy about how you use branches and stuff in GitHub. The rule of thumb that works for me is, is the tickets in whatever Trello, Pivotal, Jira, the place where you plan your work, break that down until you've got tickets that can be done in one day so that your branches don't live very long. Um, put everything on a branch, create a pull request for that branch and use GitHub to request reviews. Uh, that works pretty well because people can annotate lines, they can link directly to things, they can leave comments. And also, you know, code review, sometimes I've had code reviews where two people looked at it and just went, yep, looks good to me and bang, it went live straight away. I've had code reviews where people looked at it and they're like, uh, we actually need to talk about this. And so we've got around a whiteboard and realized that it was actually, it was me completely misunderstanding something about what I was trying to do. But that that's the process that works well. Take the set of changes that uh, you're proposing should be deployed into production and come up with a way of looking at those as a set of diffs. And this is where pull requests in GitHub work incredibly well, because you can just see what's changed. You can just see the things that you're suggesting to change. And also, you know, be really disciplined about if you want to change two things, make two separate sets of changes. Uh, the worst pull requests I've ever seen are the ones where someone's like, I added a new feature and also I cleaned up the code base. And you're like, well, there's a thousand changes here now because you fixed all the tabs and spaces. And somewhere in there, there's six lines of code which are changing the security for our login system. How are we ever going to find the important bit um, amongst the noise? So you know, try and keep the smallest possible thing that can be merged and deployed live. Spin that up as a, a pull request or an isolated set of changes and use the tools you've got. GitHub's code review feature works very well for this. Um, and you know, have a kind of informal rule. Nothing goes live until it's had two sets of eyes on it. People have to review something before it can be deployed. Thank you. OK. Uh, there, this is not a question, but uh, thank you for your great talk from Artem. Hey, and, Artem. <laughs> and thank you Artem, for watching. Artem is asking, are you going to play the guitar at the after party as you did last year? I believe we do not have this uh, special sound as we had last year. This is only Zoom. I think we, we might be able to figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, like seven hours to figure something out, right? Yeah. Why not? Well, I, I, I do actually have, I'm, I'm going to do a live concert in a couple of weeks, and I've been experimenting with the setup to get the guitar and the microphone going. Uh, it doesn't work through Zoom because Zoom doesn't really do music very well, but it can stream directly to YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and do uh, you know Carl Franklin who does .NET Rocks? Um, Carl has been doing uh, online live concerts from his, his studio where it's just him with his guitar singing some songs. Uh, so yeah, we, we can have a go later. It might work, it might not, but it'd be nice to try it out and see what happens. We can have a dry so, run. Yeah. <laughs> All right, stick around for that. I'm actually amazed that, that people got up on a Saturday morning to watch a YouTube stream. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> well, we already have 11 o'clock, so it's not that early in the morning as you have. Well, this is true. But also I've tried your vodka and... and <laughs> We've got one more question uh, and yeah. uh, we'll be wrapping up, I think. Hi, Dylan, says Dmitry. Thank you for the bright presentation. How to gently incline a customer of a B2C project to a smooth transition to new technologies? That's, I, I'd say so the first thing, and that's, that's quite a deep question. First thing is to really be honest with yourself about why you think the new technology is necessary. Because um, there, are, there are two reasons why new technology gets introduced in software. One is that it genuinely solves the problem. It saves money, it makes the system faster, improves security. Uh, the other one is that the developers are bored and they want something new to play with. And I've seen both of these things happen. 
And you know, there's the, the, the classic thing that comes up is someone going, oh, well, this, this system is, is no good because it's written in Visual Basic. We need to rewrite the whole thing in Angular and React. Um, and you need to be very, very kind of honest with yourself and your team about like, okay, we know you don't like Visual Basic, but does it actually work? Is it solving a problem? What are the problems we're really trying to solve here? Um, and then once you, you, know, you have a valid case for, yeah, we actually think that we need to start migrating some of this. Maybe it's just we can't hire VB programmers anymore. We need to move to React so we can recruit. Maybe it's uh, we're getting security problems that we can't fix. Second thing is work out if there's a way of running the new stuff and the old stuff side by side and wait for people to start using the new stuff because it has better features in it. If you just go in on Monday morning and you're like, the old system has been shut down, here is the new system, bang, you're gonna get one, the bugs that you just didn't catch in testing are gonna blow up in everyone's face first thing on a Monday, and that's gonna be really, really bad. It's gonna, they're gonna hate you, you're gonna hate them, everyone's gonna shout at one another, the whole thing is gonna be chaotic. If you can get the new system running side by side with the old system, then you can be like, okay, who's still using the old one? Look at your network traffic and your metrics. Like we got six people down in the accounts team who still won't use the new platform that we built. Go and talk to them and be like, what is it you're doing? Like, oh, they'll have a report that you didn't even know about that you're like, oh, we didn't think of that. Of course, yeah. And then you can start porting those features across um, and always kind of you know keep track of what is the investment in the new technology? What's the investment in maintaining the old technology? Most customers care about, you know, they care about, well, good customers care about good user experience. They care about, you know, morals and integrity, but they also care about money. And even bad customers still care about money. And figuring out how to communicate the changes you're proposing into short-term and long-term Cost. You know, there's a point when you have enough responsibility on any kind of software system where you do need to learn a bit about business and revenue, and uh, and that's a whole world of complexity. But a lot of things become easier to engage in conversations once you have some understanding around that. Thank but, you, Dylan. Yeah.